Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this important webinar today. The name of the webinar is Quality Assessment, Empowering the Contact Center Manager and the C-Suite, brought to you by ScoreBuddy. And um, without further ado, my name is Ellen Steinlauf, and before I introduce our speakers, I want to express our excitement to be able to bring this webinar to you and to say that ScoreBuddy has become a thought leader as well as a premier solution provider in the contact center quality assessment segment. And so we just want to say that our solution is being adopted by very large as well as mid-sized contact center outsourcers and industry players alike. And it's important for us to give you the context for this webinar as follows. So as the contact center becomes one, if not the most important channel for customer engagement and retention, and as the methods of contact for customers surrounding the center have become more ubiquitous, including phone, email, and chat, the agent's performance has become crucial to providing excellent customer service. ScoreBuddy is at the center of this with its contact center quality assessment solution. It's being used by more than 80,000 agents and many major global brands. And the main benefits that are derived by our clients are measurably improved customer experience, a high return on investment, and immediate payback many times in less than a month. Today's webinar is intended to help you understand why customer journey success is dependent on the investments being made in preparing and supporting agents, how to evolve your QA framework to create exceptional customer experience, and we've written a lot about that and you can see it on the website um, if you'd like, and the ScoreBuddy website talking about the framework, and how companies like VoxPro have revolutionized their approach to QA, delivering dramatic business outcomes, so it's a case study, and then how to use ScoreBuddy to connect the dots and improve MPS scores. I'm going to have our panelists, Sheila McGee-Smith and Derek Corcoran, introduce themselves and present their perspectives, and then we will have a short discussion by the panelists followed by audience questions. Without further delay, our presenters will introduce themselves. Sheila? Thank you, Ellen, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sheila McGee-Smith, and I am an industry analyst, and I've been following the contact center market full-time since 1990. Uh, for the first 10 years, that was with a, an analyst house, and for the last uh, 17 years as an independent. It's an interesting and exciting area, contact center, and it's been a great choice for a career. I'm sure Derek would agree. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Derek? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Derek Corcoran, uh, CEO of Sentient. Spent the majority of my professional career working in and advertise, uh, adver, advising on the contact center technologies and operations, working with AT&T and Lucent in the past. I set up Sentient in 2001 to uh, develop software applications delivered via the cloud. We designed and launched ScoreBuddy in 2013, working closely with a number of uh, BPO outsource clients to resolve real-world issues and uh, foster positive, measurable change in those organizations. So we come from the school of hard knocks, and we hope that uh, all that learning has been built into the platform. OK, thank you, Derek. Um, my name is Ellen Steinloff. I'll be our, your moderator today. And um, I'm the managing partner of Pyramon Advisors. I work very closely with ScoreBuddy's executive team in marketing strategy, execution, demand gen, and sales integration. And without further ado, um, I'd like Sheila to, uh, uh, to start her presentation. Thank you again, Ellen. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, effectively, customer interactions with our businesses today rarely occur in person. Most contact happens through some electronic means. Right? Uh, 30 years ago, businesses drove technological advances. But today, consumers are driving technology change. And they're demanding the ability to interact with your business in a way that is most convenient for them. The other thing is, Today, consumer choices have broadened. They aren't just limited to visiting a mall to shop. Instead, they use digital technology. They can place 
you know, orders for shops anywhere in the world. Just think about Christmas, you know, around the corner. Because of expanding mobile commerce, customers can get their shopping done at the busiest times of year without stepping foot in a store or a post office. Looking forward to that myself. So not long ago, most of us limited the use of our mobile devices to finding basic information, you know, reserving, conducting highly personal interactions like shopping to more secure locations, right? Uh, we didn't necessarily trust those devices. Today, most of us are confident that those issues have been resolved. We're more willing to complete transactions on a mobile device. And, and because so many of us are willing to use them, we're in a position to make and execute purchase decisions 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So that kind of demand from customers puts today's businesses in, in the hot seat. You've always had to meet your customer needs. Now you have to do it at an increased pace, during new hours, using new methods. So while voice-based communication with, with customers still plays a strong role, consumers are increasingly looking to digital communication methods, like those shown here, and demanding the flexibility to interact with companies through the customer's preferred media. So when I say that the smartphone changes everything, it puts all of those channels into the hand of a consumer at one time. And so I, I love ha hearing these discussions about whether a contact center has to be omni-channel or not. And I think this slide alone you know, really reinforces the need for contact centers to be able to handle all of these channels. Next slide. Because at, at the end of the day, customers that interact with a contact center likely started that journey on the web or on their mobile phone. Picking up the phone and calling a company to place an order or to resolve a customer service issue is rarely the first choice of consumers anymore. The question is, do your contact center policies and procedures recognize that fact? Do you equip agents with the knowledge of other customer interactions that may have happened two minutes ago or three days ago or last month? Are you are your training procedures, are your quality management procedures such that they acknowledge what you're seeing on the screen right now? You know, customers who request the assistance of a live agent via a phone call or chat have typically taken three to five steps prior to engaging with the agent. They performed a Google search. They asked a friend or a family member. They searched your company website to get an answer. They downloaded or installed the, the mobile app and tried to get an answer that way. They looked for a YouTube video. So the, the steps your customers take from the time they start to complete some action until it's completed is known as the customer journey. So uh, examples of all those steps are, are shown here. And the question is how do we train and inform agents to understand this journey and help customers pick up from where they are on the journey and not just starting from scratch all over again. Next slide. So it's interesting. There's a lot of talk right now about artificial intelligence, right? And, you know, chatbots. And will those, how important will they be in the contact center? So I was uh, late this summer on, uh, online reading some research from McKinsey and Company, very well-known general management consulting firm. And they had done research across different job titles and different tasks within those titles to find out what jobs really could be replaced today given the current technology with artificial intelligence, with robotic means. And I'll, I'll tell you, there was with some trepidation that I put in the title customer service representative to find out what was that answer going to be, okay? And this is, uh, is what I found out, that of the things that customer service representatives, the agents that we use today in contact centers, of the things that they do, a robot could perhaps replace 29% of that today, just less than a third, and that the tasks that a robot could not do was 71%. And the other statistic was that if you were a CSR, if that was your job, it was safer than 62% of all the other jobs that exist out there. 
so an interesting point, right? Um, I think you know that this list of what robots can do, you know, collect deposits, provide notifications, you know, review information, uh, makes sense. But it's also it's so important to understand what robots can't do, what humans will continue to be needed to do, uh, to respond to customer problems or complaints to explain regulations or policies, to interview employees, to actually execute sales or, or other financial transactions, to recommend things, you know, when there are alternatives. Now, robots are not ready to do those things today. So I think this reinforces the notion that we have to have systems in place that help our agents do these things that robots can't do and that are increasingly uh, more complex than what they were in the past. Next slide. So, so gone are the days when customers called a bank to find out if a check cleared or called a retailer to order a pair of shoes. Companies offer and, and customers are embracing self-service options, primarily on the web or, or from a mobile device, as we said. But when customers do pick up the phone or open a chat with an agent, it's generally because self-service hasn't worked. It's because the issue is out of the ordinary or too complex to get an easy self-service answer. So whatever the previous steps may be, too often when the customer finally gets to an agent, he or she's frustrated. They want fast answers. They're looking for a super agent someone who knows all the steps that have already been taken, why he or she is frustrated, how to get an answer in a reasonable amount of time, and get that done in a single contact. Next slide. So we talked about the customer journey, but there are agent journeys as well. And as you think about what tools you need in your contact center, to support the consumer of today, you also have to think about how do I support the agent of today and what processes and tools am I putting in place to do that. As you hire those agents today, they're going to be the agents and the supervisors in 2020. Well, what skills are they going to need? What training are they going to need? What tools should you be building now to support what is, is easily more complex calls than we've ever had before, right? You know, the, the, the timeline for this increase in complexity is actually quite short, right? Probably the last five years. Those five years when, um, you know, we, we go to the mobile phone to answer the quick questions or we, you know, bring up an iPad or other tablet device, um, that's only been in a relatively short time. And I think what we're finding is that a lot of contact centers haven't caught up, haven't caught up to this notion of creating super agents and planning the journey that their agents are on. Next slide. The other part of, of having a, a broader array of tools that you use to manage and support your agents is you know, this, this notion of Uberizing the contact center workforce, right? I, it was interesting. I was at uh, Dreamforce last week, uh, Salesforce's annual event, with 173,000 of my closest friends, apparently. Um, but one of the statistics that their head of people, their, their president for people, shared with uh, some of the analysts who were there is that 63% of Salesforce's workforce are millennials, okay? And in the contact center market, probably a similar percentage, right? Maybe 50, but at least north of 50% typically of agents come from that millennial generation. And so one of the things that Salesforce's uh, head of HR talked about, of human resources, and that we think about in the contact center is, what are, are we doing enough to enable millennials to have the tools that they want to run their work life, right? So are we making learning available to them? 
Are we pushing out their statistics to them? Are we creating the information that they want to help themselves run their work life, but also to become better at what they do and to, to be on that path to becoming the super agents that will be reinforced more and, and be more valuable to the business. Next slide. So if we, we think about it, what are, what are the challenges that affect companies' ability to meet the needs of today's consumer to create those super agents? So what I'm showing here is data from a benchmarking report that's been going on for 20 years and one of the reasons that I love this data so much. Dimension Data is a global systems integrator, and every year they go out and speak to about a 1,000 different businesses and ask them a series of questions very central to customer experience and the contact center. So in the data that was published this year from interviews earlier in 2017, when asked what the main challenge affecting your customer experience technology system, the number one answer was legacy systems that inhibit flexibility and progress. Right? And if you think about it, we're right in the throes of contact centers and, and, and businesses for other applications as well, moving from premises-based systems to the cloud to get the kind of flexibility that will allow them to meet the needs of today's customers. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Derek now to talk about the kind of, you know, new age, non-legacy, cloud-based, you know, quality assurance systems that really help fit the bill for some of those um, challenges that I've talked about over the last few minutes. Derek. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Uh, okay, we'll look over these next couple of slides. Uh, I want to share our journey, which we've uh, undertaken with our customers, and uh, I suppose some of the learnings that, that we've gathered along that process. To put things in context, I'm going to start with uh, the, the, the quality assessment value chain. So really want to quickly describe the workflow and the process underlying a typical QA framework. In many cases, our, our clients started uh, using spreadsheets as a data gathering mechanism or web forms with an in-house database. But the basic processes that we represent in this diagram are, are, are similar across all organizations. The starting point is the gathering of the raw data, using typically a scorecard as a standardized reference to look at behaviors, internal process adherence, and, and outcomes. The data is then typically normalized to allow for comparisons so that we can compare an agent to an agent or a team to a team. And targets and goals reflect the business needs and hopefully the customer's expectations. Most organizations at this point would use calibration to try and maintain consistent scoring. Then separate survey tools would be used to measure customer sentiment in the form of perhaps CSAT or NPS. And that tends to be uh, from a different part of the organization and to, to be somewhat standalone. The combining of the internal and external data then hopefully identifies training gaps to be filled, poor or broken processes, uh, and negative behaviors that need to be managed. And then the idea is that these learnings insights should then feed into new iterations of the scorecard, resetting of targets and thresholds, and really reflecting uh, changing uh, business objectives and goals. What I want to talk to you about now is the concept of a, uh, or to develop the concept of a QA framework, and the idea that it evolves. It starts uh, from, the, from uh, an early phase, and what we've witnessed with our clients is that there are probably three distinct phases of evolution in the deployment of a QA framework. The starting point for many is operational, and the focus there is managing poor performance, looking for consistency and monitoring existing processes, basically getting to grip on how the service is currently delivered. As the information is better organized and accessible and the insight gain starts to be applied tactically, uh, you can start introducing changes to the behaviors that you ask of your agents and the process to uh, deliver measurable improvements in quality. And then finally, Working through that tactical stage, having identified the root causes and understood uh, how customer dissatisfaction occurs, organizations begin to understand the correlation between 
the quality of the service delivered, the consistency of that service, and how it can affect real fundamental change in terms of outcomes. So looking a little bit at the operational side, your focus typically when you're in the operational stage of, of development is usually on managing the service delivery as it is today. So we're looking at the adherence to process, we're looking at compliance with regulation, and managing obviously pure, poor performance with a view to delivering a consistent service experience. That tends to be the driver when you're in the operational stage. What's needed at this stage is an efficient and flexible mechanism for gathering data on performance, looking closely at the outcome of individual customer interactions. Next slide. Okay, so we're at the tactical level now. As an organization learns from the body of data gathered during the operation stage, the focus can, can afford to shift to understanding the root causes of customer or agent dissatisfaction. So we need to look at this in the whole. Uh, we're looking for training gaps, we're looking for poor or broken processes. We're looking at agent enablement and how we train our agents to make better decisions and to support the customers and the behaviors. Typically, organizations will engage the agents as stakeholders in this change process, using their input to revise and to reiterate the QA framework, tailoring the goals and the objectives, and looking at it by channel, because the expectations as customers will be different by channel. Using that empirical data, then, to influence and persuade other parts of the business to change and support improved customer experience and delivery. So this data gathering exercise and under deep diving that data and sharing and collaborating around the data is a mechanism for drawing in other parts of the business to support the customer service delivery. This is a piece of data that was gathered by, uh, it's sourced from a company called uh, Contact Babel. They run two uh, annual reports looking at uh, US and UK contact centers. And uh, what it's really doing is highlighting um, the fact that uh, there's a, an acute awareness of the key role the agent performs in satisfying the customer, but more importantly, the consequent impact on revenues. So if you look at the uh, top three characteristics to encourage agents, uh, managers are looking at improved sales and conversion rates, but they're also highly focused on high CSAT and customer feedback scores. So there is an intuitive understanding of the connection between how the agent delivers a customer experience and how the customer will ultimately report on that experience. Although it's intuitive, connecting dots between individual agent performance and customer sentiment really requires a well thought out framework where there's input from all the stakeholders in the organization. And also that that framework is, is supported by a robust tool to gather, aggregate, and disseminate that critical data. So assuming that we've gone through this process and, and learned and uh, aggregated that data and understood the root causes of, of uh, broken issues and, and customer dissatisfaction, we're now armed with a clear understanding of past and present customer experiences. Improved processes and skills, uh, and we also, the contact center is now ready to contribute to delivering strategic goals uh, of the organization. Ultimately, the objective is to impact growth and shareholder value and in the process become a competitive differentiator. With a wealth of data and the insight gathered by the customer services director, they can now demonstrate to senior management uh, how attention to detail, continuous monitoring, and the focus on customer experience will drive customer loyalty and have a positive brand impact. And that, in anybody's language, is a strategic uh, uh, objective. The objective is to understand and quantify the correlation between the quality of the service that you deliver as an organization and the customer's sentiments towards your brand. In the context of Scorebelly, we're providing an integrated, flexible, and scalable platform to help organizations on this journey. Just let me illustrate with a client journey, a company we've worked with for a number of years, and I suppose we've witnessed their evolution. FoxPro are an amazing uh, and interesting uh, organization. Very successful outsourced service provider, uh, so right at the, the bleeding edge of service provision. Uh, they have over 2,700 uh, 2, employees in seven countries, including California and the Philippines. And um, They were recently acquired by TELUS International, uh, the $10 billion Canadian company who employ 28,000 uh, uh, employees globally and specialize in BPO and outsourced services. 
They work with clients such as Google, Stripe, Airbnb. Now, VoxPro have grown through uh, a laser-like focus on service excellence as their differentiator in, in a, a very competitive field. As a BPO, flexibility is a key uh, requirement in terms of clients. Because their systems vary, uh, the BPO has to be able to mold their requirements uh, or their delivery to the client requirements. Originally, when we first worked with VoxPro, they were using spreadsheets to manage QA, um, and then they installed Scorbuddy three years ago. And like I said, uh, they started at a, with, with an operational focus to try and fix the obvious, to try and manage consistency, and to try and understand what service, uh, the, the quality of the service that they were actually delivering at that time. Their quality assessment framework evolution really matches uh, their success and growth. They, they recently introduced a very innovative program, and I believe it really takes QA to the next level. Faced with large amounts of metadata uh, coming from multiple systems, which is a, is a common issue in, in the complex and dynamic environment that we work in, Foxpro needed to make sense of what they were seeing. Internal QA scores were hitting their targets, but the NPS scores just didn't seem to be reflecting this. So a program was conceived and designed to try and have a material and measurable impact on NPS on behalf of a specific client. They got the client's buy-in, and they selected a dedicated team of agents to, in, uh, to engage in this process. I suppose the key to the process really was uh, engaging the agents in self-scoring. Okay? So what they did was allow the agents to score their own customer interactions. And interestingly, the QA scores initially dipped, but actually were more in line with the NPS scores. When they calibrated the agent self-scores against the normal evaluator scores, agents, interestingly, tended to be harsher critics of their own performance. Over a period of weeks, these agents became more acutely aware of their own behaviors and how that impacted quality. They began to modify those behaviors, and slowly but surely, the NPS scores moved. At the end of the program, they had moved the NPS scores by three to four points, and what they ended up with was a, a more aligned view between the internal quality assessment scores, which are looking at internal processes as well as the customer outcomes, and the customer's view of that interaction represented by the NPS score. The powerful message here is that involving your agents in the process to the point of self-scoring will have a material impact on NPS. And understanding that correlation and being able to measure that and quantify it allows you to take that up the line to the C-suite. So, considering where we started with VoxPro, where they were using spreadsheets, not exactly a strategic tool or a bus platform, I wanted to put uh, where we see quality assessment in the context of the technology stack that we're all used to working with in the typical contact center. So, where we have complex self-service uh, coming through website support, mobile devices, FAQs, and then the complex one-to-ones that Sheila described uh, where you know, there's a problem that needs solving or there's a solution needs providing. That's what's hitting your agents. The quality assessment uh, solution should really sit across all the channels. It should sit uh, with the CRM system and beside the telephony platform. So it's going to look at the interactions across the multiple channels. It's going to take cases that may be lodged in your CRM system. And hopefully, we can combine then surveys and customer sentiment and blend that into our understanding of what the actual outcomes between our agents and the customer service, uh, the customer actually is. Okay, so what I want to do is summarize very quickly what we, uh, what we are trying to say today and, uh, and your key takeaways. Sheila referred to social and mobile channels proliferating, and we all experience that as, as individual consumers. But they tend to automate the less complex customer interactions, the transactional stuff, the balance inquiry, uh, the checking, the, the delivery, that sort of thing. Your management tools must evolve to train agents to manage more complex interactions because that's what's coming through. And uh, those agents need to be enabled not just with the technology that we wrap around them, but also with the training, the knowledge, and I suppose the authority to take control of a customer interaction and to resolve that on behalf of the, of the customer. 
Highly skilled super agents are what customers expect and demand, and they're going to be in high demand. So uh, maintaining them and supporting them is going to be, a, be uh, the key to reducing churn. And then I talked about uh, operational, tactical, and strategic as a journey in terms of evolving and developing your quality assessment framework. The question really for each of you is, where are you on this curve? Are you in the operational phase? Are you moving between operational and beginning to understand the tactical advantages of, of quality assessment as a tool in your arsenal? Or are you moving into the strategic phase where it's really getting attention of senior management and informing their view of where they take the company next? Connecting QA with external customer sentiment will really drive real change, and we've seen that with the customers we're working with. And putting QA at the center of your service delivery and improvement will move the strategic needle and give you a competitive advantage as you understand exactly what is going to deliver that superlative customer experience. I'm going to hand back now to Ellen. Uh, Ellen, do you want to take a... Yes, thank you, Derek. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, while we're waiting for questions from the audience, we have a couple that have just come in, but I want to take a moment to ask a couple of questions of our panelists to clarify a few points as they were going through. And I'm going to start with Sheila on this first one. Sheila, who, who do you think has to become invested in the quality of interactions today versus 10 years ago? Because these are no longer operational systems. They're strategic. They're on the front line of the business, affecting customer engagement and retention. So who, who has to become more invested in the quality? Uh, so it's interesting. Um, even this, this notion of uh, customer journey, I think, has expanded in the last 12 to 24 months to really talk about digital transformation of businesses. And the reason is that, you know, if you're in the contact center or even in, in marketing or sales, um, what we were finding is when we tried to change the customer journey, it had to impact other pieces of the business. So an agent's ability to give information on uh, payments or invoices, for example, was dependent on the finance department. And whether a product was, had been shipped or not was dependent on the shipping department. And so this notion of customer experience and, and providing that at a, um, a first-class level to, cu to customers really implies the whole business is involved. And this digital transformation that's occurring that we've talked about with consumers has to happen across the business, right? So we're talking about CMOs, chief marketing officers, who care about um, the, the quality of the interactions that are happening. We're talking about um, chief revenue officers who care about the quality of interactions because they know that that will impact their downstream revenue, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. In the last few weeks, I've had the opportunity to talk to a couple of, uh, a few companies that have transformed the way we do everyday things. Everybody thinks about Uber transforming the taxi business or the car rental business. But I talked to a company that has transformed uh, car buying. <coughs> and they're, they're, the company is Carvana. And you can go online and do everything soup to nuts, including insurance and financing, and seeing complete videos of buying a car online. And for them, quality assurance would be across not just agents in their contact center, but they're now thinking about different types of employees within their business and what they do as also being impacted by and measured by what we thought traditionally of as contact center systems, right? And I'm sure Derek would agree that increasingly we're seeing inside sales organizations using and being given the same kind of tools that in the past were really contact center agent tools. So, you know, coming back to your question, um, I think the digital transformation of businesses ha is implying that more chief executives and more executive departments are involved in the quality of interactions, and also more titles within a business are involved in using these tools and, and getting access to the kind of quality measurements that Derek talked about. Thanks, Sheila. Anything to add, Derek? 
Yeah, I absolutely, uh, totally concur with, with Sheila's view there. What, I suppose what we've seen and relatively recently in a, a conversation with a, a US-based client, um, they started their, I suppose, revision and, uh, and evolution of their, their contact center and used the concept of effortless service as a sort of a, a driver for, for change. And what they found and what they've recently introduced is it's beginning to extend into the back office. So they're mobilizing other departments that are supporting and servicing the, uh, the contact center and the customer by using the same basic framework and extending that downstream. So it, it, it's interesting, it, it is, you know, that what we would be very familiar with in the context of the contact center is beginning to leak out into other parts of the business and make a difference. Excellent, yes. Um, well, I have one more quick question for the panelists and then we'll move to a couple of audience questions. During your presentation, Sheila, you talked about a super agent. How, how does a well-designed quality framework, as Derek described, support and service a, uh, a super agent? I, you know, it comes back to what tools are being used by various businesses to support the contact center and, and to support the agents. And if we look at it, only a small proportion of contact centers are really taking advantage of the newest kinds of workforce optimization applications to help us create and support uh, this super agent that we need. And, and certainly ScoreBuddy fits into that characterization, right? It's a, a new age a solution for really more sophisticated, more, more difficult um, agent issues than we've ever had before. So I think the, the, the notion of a, a quality framework supports the, and services a super agent because it, you know, too many, too many contact centers are still running by the seat of their pants, right? They're doing, you know, paper checklists for quality assessments and they haven't really taken the technology that's available and applied it to this specific problem. So I think that's where a quality framework really supports that, that super agent notion. Very good. Thanks, Sheila. Um, so from the audience, I have one important question that I think is uh, on top of everybody's mind. So how, how is customer sentiment improvement tied and or linked to improved agent performance? How do you link, you know, how are they linked? Either one of you? Yeah, I, I, I can take that. Um, well, to be honest, it's it's difficult enough to tie them together. Uh, I mean, intuitively, we, we understand that there must be a connection between how the agent performs and how the customer is going to rank that, that experience. Uh, but typically, the systems are siloed in that technology stack that I showed you earlier you know, surveys are not necessarily tied right back to the agent uh, because of the multiple systems and layers that, that we typically have to live with. So it's something of a challenge. Um, naturally, we've thought about it in depth and, and tried to design that into the platform to make it easy. But uh, ideally, what you want to do is you, you want to get customer comment and then compare and contrast that with what your internal view is of that experience. And when you're looking at the internal view, you're naturally distracted by, well, did the agent, you know, adhere to the script? Did they, you know, use the processes? What about the desktop environment? Did they use the tools? Did they put notes in the case? All of which may be invisible and immaterial, actually, to the customer. Uh, so, you know, I suppose what we're trying to highlight is that you may have what you think or perceive as a very superior service when you assess it internally, but actually the customer may not, re may not reflect that or feel that. So I think it's vital that you do tie the two things together and you have to find ways of using the platform then to uh, present that information in a, in a, a very readable uh, way. If I may <laughs> add to that, <laughs> Ellen, uh, I'm reminded of what you said, Derek, about VoxPro that yeah. when agents were able to assess themselves, they were harsher critics of their own performance than supervisors were, right? And, you know, tying it back to this, you know, when you think about a call and how it goes by in time, right, 
sometimes you don't remember the details. That ability to be able to go back and self-assess helps tie you back, I think, to the customer sentiment. Helps remind you of um, what did the customer really say when I reacted saying we're late with that or we, you know, can't you do this faster? And so I think putting this kind of a process in place uh, helps to link agent performance and customer sentiment by just offering that level of data and review to agents that's n never really been available to them in the, in the past. So tying this back to the notion that you know there are agents and super agents and obviously their processes and tools are are changing. Uh, how how do agents react to changes in their quality assessment processes or tools? What what do you see as the you know the typical reaction? Either one is. Well, I'll jump in on that and and because I think it follows from the the comments I just made about Boxpro. Right. I think that is typically what we find, um, even going back 10 or 15 years ago, when uh, you know Avaya, who owns so much of the contact center space uh, for so long, uh, when they introduced something called view stats, which was the ability of agents to have statistics uh, on their desktop of not only what, what they were doing, but in the context of what uh, their group was doing and how the, con the contact center in general was doing, that my experience is that agents um, appreciate having that data. They, in, they, they, it helps them understand how they fit into the organization. And as I said, my, my experience is that they embrace uh, the kinds of tools that now become available to them in a more application-driven, software-driven, web browser-driven kind of a contact center technology world. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, and finally, I, I, go ahead, James. Sorry, ahead. Alan, I might just pick up on, on Sheila's point there. I mean, I totally agree, and, and naturally, we're, we're right at the forefront of rolling out these new tools. And I, I would say that uh, initially, um, agents view any change of, of uh, a scoring mechanism as with suspicion, unless it's clearly managed and communicated, and it's transparent. Um, I think that's, that's the key to success. Uh, you'll engage your agents if you are open and transparent about what you're asking them to do, what you what you're using to assess, uh, and involving them in the process, and uh, that that has been absolutely the cornerstone of our design ethos mm -hmm. in terms of building out the platform. Because let's face it, agents are uh, are in, in the context of call centers, and Sheila, you refer back to the early days of Avaya, etc. You know the amount of uh, measurement and metrics that are thrown at agents uh, within that context. This is another one. And I think the the, the most uh, the secret of success is just making it absolutely open and transparent and involving them in it. I think this last question is for you, Derek. Um, during your presentation, it says mm. you talked about a super age. I'm sorry. It, this one's for for you. Is ScoreBuddy able to operate with other platforms in the contact center contact centers technology space? Yeah, um, I suppose we've made something of a virtue of, of Scorbity being a standalone system. Uh, there, there are plenty of examples of modules that plug into, um, you know, uh, digital recording platforms typically. Um, and I suppose, like I say, we made a virtue of the fact that, that Scorbity was a standalone, uh, dedicated solution. Um, having said that, we are, I suppose, following our customers. And we've delivered a number of interact in integrations with primarily CRM platforms, to be honest. Um, we think that that's probably the, the best touch point uh, where we can take cases. And the CRM sits across all channels. So whether it's an email conversation, a chat thread, or otherwise, it, that's probably the central repository. So uh, in the last six months, we've introduced um, connectivity with Salesforce. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just in beta now with a with a Zendesk integration, and we will introduce other uh, other platforms as we go. Um, it's not necessary for it to be integrated, but as I say, we're 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 following demand from our from our client base. Okay, well, thank you, Derek. Um, on behalf of ScoreBuddy, I want to thank you for your time and for your questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to visit the website at the address on your screen. There's more about QA frameworks. A lot of information that I think uh, was valuable during our webinar and is expounded upon there.
We'll be sending this deck to everyone who attended our webinar today. And in that email, we'll include a link to a white paper recently published regarding how QA frameworks can be used to assess your organization's progress towards a better overall contact center customer experience. Thank you all again. Thank you.